did high drama care about the shows we saw? Since it's your last chance to see Carousel and SpongeBob SquarePants, I have interviews with Lindsay Mendez, Alexander Gemignani, Jonathan Colton, Carl Jero, Danny Skinner, and Ethan Slater. Enjoy! Lindsay Mendez. So you are doing Carousel. In college, I played one of the snow kids. Get out of here. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. You would have been my mommy. <laughs> Excellent. What's it like? You, cause you get to play the nice character, untroubled uh, by problems, and yeah. you get to and the score. I mean, that score. It's so stunning. I'm having just the greatest time getting to live that music every every night. It's uh, thrilling. And also all the dancing. I mean, Justin Peck. I mean, classy. <laughs> yeah, he's he's really just blown me away. His uh, uh, the the whole production. I'm I'm just so proud to be a part of it. And the character is, you know, believes what's going on around. So we, you're the most necessary character there, or else it would be dreadful for us. We'd be crying all the time. <laughs> well, I have fun bringing joy to to the night, which is so heavy and beautiful. It's it's really wonderful. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. With Alexander Gimignani. And you play Mr. Snow. I do. You're a different Mr. Snow than what you do. Well, I, that's good. I think. Because you're not as you're lovable. There's a steely quality to you. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, I I think what's great about what Jack has allowed us to do is really craft three-dimensional characters, and uh, it's been great. It's been really rewarding to work on. Being choreographed by Justin Peck. I mean, the ballet world. Yeah, unbelievable. And and I love that they put all the worlds together. And Renee Fleming from the opera world, and a lot of dancers, and Justin himself from the ballet world, and. You know, tried and true musical theater performers, and uh, that could have gone horribly wrong, but it's gone horribly right. So they're wonderfully right. So I'm, I'm really excited. I know the men are not portrayed very well in this, are they? The your wife comes out much, the much better than anybody in this piece. Yeah, I mean, I think you know the 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 men of the time and in this in the community uh, that the show represents uh, have old-fashioned views on the world and uh, that that falls on ears very differently now as it should so uh, I think it's I think it's really relevant actually to be doing the show now to to bring light to some of those uh, facets oh, absolutely yeah. well congratulations and good luck with the Tony Award thank you very very much I'm very excited thank you, thank you. here we are with Jonathan Colton and what did you, what song was yours in Spongebob? Uh, I wrote the opening number, Bikini Bottom Day. Oh, wow, that's the best number of all. It totally sets it up brilliantly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a tricky thing, the opening number. I, I'm glad, I'm glad most people seem to think it uh, sets it off on the right note. So that's good. Yeah, thank you. And you're talking to a Spongebob aficionado. Me and my kid got into trouble for watching Spongebob when we went to my parents' house. We love Spongebob. So, so what was, how was it that, you know, you had all these different people doing all the different, how did that become, like, so cohesive? Well, I will say a lot of the credit for that goes to Tom Kitt, who was the orchestrator uh, and music, direct, music director, and, and just sort of, um, you know, I mean, I handed him a demo uh, of the song, and then and then he turned it into this beautiful opening number for a Broadway show, and it was kind of a miracle. And, you know, he was there to make sure it sort of had this cohesive feel from song to song, but then you still get the, um, the delight of all these different styles and all these different uh, songwriters' uh, approaches to, to SpongeBob. So a lot of credit goes to Tom, though, for keeping us keeping us in line, I think. Were you aware of SpongeBob before this even? Oh, absolutely. I mean, like you, I was a fan, and I, I watched it with my kids. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was one of those things, you know, when you're a parent and you have kids, it's nice to have a thing that you can watch together that doesn't drive you, the grown-up, crazy. And that there actually is stuff there for you. So that, that kind of multi-level work that SpongeBob does, I've always appreciated. And, you know, it was very important for us, all of us who worked on the show, to get that in there, to get, have that feel happen in the show as well. Well, you did it. Congratulations. <laughs> ah, here we are with Kyle Jarrow. How did a downtown guy like you end up doing Broadway and SpongeBob? I love it. I don't know, somehow I convinced him to let me do it. I'm a huge fan of SpongeBob, have been for years. It's kind of like a dream job, to be honest. Now you got a kid to enjoy it. I do. I have an almost two-year-old. She's a little too young to get to the theater. So hopefully we run long enough, God willing, that she can come when she's like five. And yeah, it's a challenge, right? Because the TV show, they're 11-minute episodes. It probably shows two and a half hours. 
So we just needed a story that could tie it all together and really create like, I don't know, stakes that really would drive the story. So we came up with the biggest stakes possible. The world is ending and watching these characters come together and work their way through that. Um, I don't know. That's that's what the show is. Well, congratulations. And, good, and here, here we are with Danny Skinner from SpongeBob SquarePants. So how did you capture the essence of Patrick so brilliantly? Oh, well, you know, you had to watch the television show a lot. And then you also have to have an amazing director like Tina Landau to kind of guide you through some of the stuff and kind of agree on the world that you're going to be in and then just a lot of exploration. It was a lot of fun. You must have been over the moon when you got this part. Oh, absolutely. I was a, a huge SpongeBob fan from the very beginning of the television show. And so as a kid, you know, seeing a larger character and being a large guy, it was it was kind of an amazing moment, uh, seeing kind of a character that looks like you. And so fast forward to now, and it's unbelievable that this was even a possibility that they were going to make a SpongeBob musical. So it really is a dream come true. And I love that sweet, gullible Patrick gets to be a hero and idolize. I mean, real you, you never get to be Madonna. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Patrick just wants his, to be heard, just wants his ideas to be respected. And so in this show, without spoiling too much, he gets that in a very big way. And he also kind of realizes that SpongeBob's really the most important friendship in his life. And it's, it's a really great fun and time to go through that journey night after night. You are one lovable sidekick. Oh, yes, thank you so much. Well, it's really easy when you have somebody like Ethan Slater as your as your scene partner. So really lucky in that one. Well, congratulations on win. Ethan Slater. So how did you capture SpongeBob so beautifully? Um, I had a great team around me, uh, including the, the visionary director, Tina Landau. Um, and, you know, I spent a lot of time working on figuring out the physicality of Spongebob. But the main thing on top of that or, or um, beneath that was like just tapping into the emotional core the same way that you would do with any character, which is to find what SpongeBob wants, what he cares about, uh, and, and what he will do for those things that he loves and he cares about. Um, and, and I think that SpongeBob is like a surprisingly relatable character. He, he's optimistic and, and he loves in the face of fear, which is something that I sort of aspire to as Ethan. So, um, yeah, I think... I think that was the main thing for me with SpongeBob is to to find that emotional core, and then also like work with a contortionist. <laughs> so how'd you get from one year lease to Broadway? Oh, you know. Oh yeah, I love one year lease. Uh, I've been working with one year lease since around the same time that I started working on SpongeBob, which was six years ago. Um, one year lease came up. Uh, Yanthi Demos, the artistic director, came up to. Uh, to do some work at Vassar College, which is where I went to college, and I worked with her on a student play, and she asked me to come in and audition for her company. And so since since that day, we did we did Eurydice together, the Sarah role play Eurydice. And um, since we worked together up at Vassar, I've been working with their theater company as an ensemble member, and it's worked really well hand in hand with SpongeBob. One Year Lease is a physical theater company that does uh, a lot of a lot of sort of intense plays. <laughs> uh, I recently did Please Excuse My Dear Aunt Sally with them by Kevin Armento, which is, you know, a pretty intense subject matter, but it's all about telling the story, you know, with an ensemble through physicality and of course the voice and acting. And and that was something that really helped me as I developed SpongeBob. So I'm, I'm uh, I think that they go hand in hand pretty well. I think so, too. Well, congratulations, and good luck on the Theater World Award. Congratulations. Hi, ah, here we are with Tina Landau, director of SpongeBob. So how did you bring this lovable cartoon to life so brilliantly? Because I'm a SpongeBob aficionado, and me and my kid loved it. It's better than the movie. Thank you. Well, we just tried to do a theater piece. We tried to make it live, kind of a party, a rock concert, a carnival, a show, all in one. And we had tremendous support from Nickelodeon, so we were able to, over years, just play and experiment and let our imaginations go wild. We had a blast making it. I was going to say, I mean, it, it's such a, such a fanciful, wonderful character that you get to live with. And all those rock stars contributed. Did you, were you responsible for that? Yes. Um, when I first went into Nickelodeon, that was part of what I pitched at the beginning. It was a score created by great pop, rock, soul, hip-hop, etc. artists. Uh, because SpongeBob, the world of Bikini Bottom is a world in which a lot of different things are mashed together. And it's, it's sort of like a Dada collage. And it made sense to have the score be that as well. To have it be a lot of disparate things that somehow form a whole.
How do you choose who should do which section of the story? Well, myself and Kyle Farrow, the book writer, kind of knew where songs had to come. And, you know, if it was Sandy the Squirrel who's from Texas singing, we said, well, who's a country western artist we love? I mean, a lot of it was who I wanted to meet, really, who I just wanted to, like, meet and hang out with. So did you give the music people the script and then they and tell them this is a subject matter? Yes, we gave them the particular scene. We gave them a lot of lyric prompts and some background information. We gave them a lot of ammunition. So when they sat down to write, they, they had a lot from us. And it's amazing how they sing in the characters' voices. I mean, that must be hard. It, it was. We spent a lot of time peeling back too much character voice to make sure that we maintained the humanity of all these characters. Well, you did a brilliant job. I mean, people were screaming like oh, it was a rock concert. That's that's the fun part. That's being in that theater and seeing how folks go nuts. It's such a blessing. And the critics liked it, too. That's the most shocking thing of all. I, I know. We really didn't expect anything this season in terms of, you know, reviews or awards. So the whole slew of recognition has just been like icing on the cake and totally unexpected. Well, congratulations. And I forgot to mention that Tina Landau I talked to as well. Surprise guest. And now another Broadway show that's closing September 16th, like Carousel and SpongeBob SquarePants, is Getting the Band Together, which is a book by Ken Davenport and the Grendel Shots, and music and lyrics by Mark Allen with additional material by Sarah Salzberg, directed by John Rando. Poor Mitch loses his job as a stockbroker, and with his tail between his legs, goes back home to live with his mama, Mary Lou Henner, a very sprightly and skinny mama indeed. She's a rockin' mama. And speaking of rockin', he gets home and he sees his old girlfriend, sees his old friends, and reminisces and remembers about the fact that they used to have a band. And they were, you know, involved in a battle of the band situation, which they won. And he was thinking, oh, let's get, let's get the band back together. Because the, the person he defeated is all upset. He's always wanted that trophy, uh, played by Brandon Williams. He is the best villain ever. He's just so much fun. And he's going out with uh, Mitch's ex-girlfriend. And so there's all that going on. So there's all this, like, you know, winning winning the girl back, winning the band back, winning his mother back. His mother's interested in his best friend. That's the only ick factor. That was kind of like, really? I mean, okay. But it's Mary Lou Henner, so we kind of forgive. But it was a lot of fun. And, um... And uh, there's going to be more from Jan on Facebook, but he, as he puts it, an exuberant celebration of the American midlife or any time of life crisis and how rewarding it can be if you finally get to follow your dreams. So we are both, I'm going to get a face for him too. Turn it around, Eva. We are both giving this a major happy face, two major happy faces. I'm sorry it's closing. It's just a lot of fun. The Mint is reviving Lillian Helmet's 1936 play, Days to Come, directed by J.R. Sullivan. A strike of brushmakers in a factory town in Ohio in 1936 reveals that a well-meaning factory owner, Andrew Rodman, and the honest union rep, Thomas Firth, are both babes in the woods when it comes to political realities. Far less naive are the owner's opportunist lawyer, Henry Ellicott, and the professional strikebreaker Sam Wilkie, who hires thugs and uses dirty tactics, and the professional union organizer Leo Whalen, who knows that the only chance the union men have is to wait it out and not fight against Wilkie's forces. Also in the mix are Julie Rodman, Andrew's strained wife, and Cora Rodman, his nervous sister. And we must say that Harry Finer said Nothing can be finer than a finer <laughs> set. In fact, the minute I came in, I said, this looks like a Harry Finer set. He's gotten so good, I can recognize his sets now. They're brilliant. Anyway, I, I just know Lillian Hellman as a sort of, you know, dash of hammock, serious, rabble-rousing kind of person. So I, this, I found this a very pleasant play. 
okay. It was like, yes, it had a rabble rousing pro union, you know, stuff in it, but it also had family drama in it too, which I mean, I mean from little boxes, but mm -hmm. this was good family drama. And I really, you really care because the poor owner of the factory, he was a good guy. He was like, he was welcoming the town, invited over for dinner. He loved his workers, but then he was persuaded that, no, 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 you're, you're losing money. You have, you can't have strikes. You can't have this. You can't help the workers like you want to. And so they, they hire well, these thugs. She's a soft-hearted socialist <laughs> coming from a rich background. So there's the good banker and the little foxes and, you know, the well-intentioned factory owner here. Um, I did like some of the family melodrama, especially the nervous sister. Oh, Mary Bacon. She's always she's such great. a wonderful actress. But the, um, the straying wife who's kind of feeling um, that the union organizer could redirect her life if he would only have sex with her, I thought that was a dreadful scene. But this is not one of her best plays. It has some really creaky writing, but it's still absorbing. But I found interesting was the play they did before at the Mint, which, which had British politicians in it. It had a similar situation where you know the the rich aristocratic woman goes slumming with the with the up and coming you know destitute guy who rises from rags to riches, and she wants to you know see what the other half is like and falls for that other half. So it's like you know rich people I guess like to go slumming and fall in love with their. It's a common theme. Yes, I guess so. It just was interesting that they did this sort of theme back but, to back. But the mint productions are always great. They though. are They're beautiful yes. to look at. Great and, costumes, great lighting. And to see a, a Lillian Hellman play that you know you've never seen before, even I never even heard of. Yeah. That's like really you're getting a, a literary and a theatrical treat, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm giving this a total happy face. For me, it's mixed faces plus. But it was good to see it, and it is very obscure, so you might not get a chance again. Um, I went to see, and Jan went to see, and Lisa Ramachi went to see some plays at the Dream Up Festival at Theatre for the New City. The first one I'm talking about is Lorraine Lucio's Moving Bodies, which brings to our attention Emile du Châtelet, known as the Mistress of Voltaire, but was much more, a brilliant scientist and mathematician who proved Newton wrong, made math accessible to everyone, and yet because she was a woman was dismissed and not allowed to enter the Academy of Science. Jonathan Tindall, who played Voltaire, just finished being Alexander the Great at the Potomac Theater Project. And Miriam Sir, the director, had to step in at the last minute to take over the lead of Emile. And Jan, that was me. Now, Jan says that it was a great pleasure to hear these things discussed, to learn exactly what women had to suffer that when they were thought of as possessions. It was because of women like La Marquise de Châtelet that women began to have a voice in the world, and for that we should all be grateful. He found the script to be tightly crafted, moving from episode to episode with understanding and grace. It was very epistolatory, like, like Les Liaisons d'Angerouge, lots of letters from this gossipy woman commenting on the action. It was a joy to watch their relationship unfold through the seas of manners and prescriptions required by the social mores of these turbulent times. Moving Bodies is an excellent period play with finely wrought costumes and excellent lighting effects. So he gives this a happy face and I give it a mixed face plus. I'm the first reviewer of The Dragon Griswind, currently playing at the Dream Up Festival at Theatre for the New City. Written by Carrie Robbins, directed by Joseph Sicari, starring Charles Turner as the Dragon Griswind, Jenny Vath and Steve Hauk as androids, and Robert Meskin as the Singing Fish. <laughs> um, I've been told that this is supposed to be an allegory about aging and loss. Um, I, as somebody who's getting older and who has experienced loss in my life, I didn't see any of that in this performance. To be honest, to be brutally honest, I'm not even sure why this thing was written and performed. Um, I found it to be humorless, not poignant, boring. The acting was, such as it was, was grade school level. The singing fish was good, except I wasn't too fond of his choice of music. Uh, the sets were pretty much nothing. Um, I read it as an anti-nuclear allegory, which goes to me to show how mm, 
incomprehensible it was. I mean, how you could come across as uh, something on aging and loss when it's when somebody in the audience reads it as anti-nuclear, I didn't get it. I did not. I don't recommend this play at all. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, we we, we disagree on this one. I, look, you're you're my stand-in for Mark. <laughs> Mark and I always disagree about stuff. I liked it a lot. And yes, I thought Charles Turner was this bedraggled dragon shuffling around, and it was just so adorable to me. And then and then the androids come, and and he's so lonely because he's the last person left on this decimated last planet. Last dragon. <laughs> yeah, but there weren't any people there either, I don't think. But he was the last dragon. Yeah, so he's the last of his kind. So it's like, it, I, I did feel the, lo the loss of, and the sadness and all that. And then, and then these aliens come and, you know, and he's got someone to talk to and he's hoping that he'll, br he'll bring him back to civilization so it can be around people and, and, and somebody, even if it's androids again. And he, and he talks about how chess and he knew Bobby Fischer and he, and he talks about about, um, oh, there was something else he was distracting them with. What was it now? I can't, I've got to look again. Um, oh, um, uh, that's right, the amb iambic pentameter poetry. That he wrote. Yes, he writes poetry. He's a very Renaissance dragon. They all are. Yeah. But, and, but I mean, and, here's and, the reality. And, and also, Stephen Hawk and uh, 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 Jen Bath, I think they're wonderful actors. And I mean, they, I thought they were very convincing aliens. But the thing is, I mean, yes, there was pathos in him attempting to talk them into taking them with him, and I understood the sadness of him being the last dragon left on Earth. But my problem that I had was after they left, he was just like, eh. I mean, he went, he went and started writing in his diary, and he was cheerful, and he was upbeat, and I was thinking this would have been the opportunity for them to really hammer home the, the theme of loss. I mean, here he was offered an opportunity. He saw that there was... Earth again, the new planet where Earthlings had colonized, and he wanted to be on it, and that was denied him, and he knew he was being left for, God knows how long dragons live, for the rest of his eons alone on the Earth, and it didn't seem to bother him. Oh, no, no. Remember, I, I, I guess it is flew by you, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but he was like basically thinking, wait a minute. I can get there myself. I'm going to start weight, lifting weights and eating better. I'm going to fly. He had a goal now. See, at least now he has a goal to, to get himself in shape and fly to this place. Eva, how himself. many times have you and I had that conversation? We're going to start eating better. We're going to work out. We're going to get in shape. And we're still... And we still haven't done it. And he wasn't going to do it either. Well, you knew that. Well, no, because I still think I can lose weight and clean the house because I'm an optimist <laughs> and, it, and it was trying to be an optimistic <laughs> ending instead of a depressing ending. But if it's about aging and loss, then it should not have gone that route. Well, I don't know. Anyway, I'm giving it a happy face minus. All right, I'll give it a sideways for Charles, what's his name? Turner. Charles Turner. And then the rest of it was just like... Sideways? You mean mixed? Mixed. Mixed. You see how often I do this. <laughs> <laughs> mixed. Okay. And the last thing I saw for the Female Festival, and the best, oh my God, was this good. The Wrong Box, based on the classic novel by Robert Louis Stevenson and Lloyd Osborne, with book music and lyrics by Kit Goldstein, Grant, directed and choreographed by Michael Chase Goslin, was sheer to last from first notes from a lecture and a subsequent music to the spirited dancing. All the shenanigans center around cousins trying to have their relatives outlive each other so they can inherit a tontine, which is when a group of people invested money and the last remaining survivor gets it all. In this case, 100,000 pounds, which in late 19th century is a veritable fortune. It is kind of reminding of Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, mm -hmm. where he was killing off all of his relatives. Oh, in this case, the relatives were trying to keep the relatives alive to keep the money. Insults and accusations abound, while a corpse is foisted off all over town, and smuggled Greek statues are trying to be foisted off. Copious amounts of alcohol are consumed, and a profligate prankster sets all the trouble in mo motion. Foist and laugh, this is a heap of fun, and really, if you can only see one show at Dream Up, I recommend this one, and Wikipedia Emily de Chatelet, because she's got an interesting story, too. 
And don't forget you can find our reviews on Facebook, on Twitter, and you can find the show on YouTube on Eva Heineman. And Tevia Serva is back, so if you missed it the first time around, now is a good time to see it. And these are the shows we talked about. This looked interesting, so I threw it in. And these are shows we are going to that will be closed by the time of our next show, September 29th. The Tempest Sour Grapes. I love these people so much. I love their shows. So check it out. Dorothy Lyman's in a play in the bleak midwinter. Pirandello, a bunch of Pirandello plays, September 29th. And Vitali's only here for one more month. I'm going to go see and talk about it in the next show. Dear for new audience is back with the Emperor with Kathleen Hunter. And some great cabaret going on. Always check out 15 Fine Sense 54 below. Uh, Me the Peep at Lori Beachman West Bank. We're going to go September 18th to check that out. Special events. Parody Productions is having their gala on September 26th at 6 o'clock. The 10th Annual Planet Connection Awards is going on September 21st at 7.30. Eliza Ben has me her play in Dade, France, September 15th at 3 and 8. Laramie, a legacy, is going on September 24th at 7 o'clock. And the Innovative Theater Awards is September 24th. When I have more information, I'll post it on the High Drama page. And I'm going to be seeing Agnes on September 11th. I've been told it's a very special play at 59th and 59th. Special happenings at 92nd Street Y. Sally Field and Jane Fonda and Bill Murray are going to be there. And for the Dream Up Festival, to go see um, Moving Bodies, Wrong Box, or Dragon Grizzwind, check out their website. And for free at Theater for the City, they're doing their Street Theater Shame or the Doomsday Machine. And the Clown Festival's at the Brick. You might have seen me on New York One getting pie-eyed, literally. I won because I look like a pie, but I had pie in one eye. I love the pie fight. And the Crown Mancers of the Public Domain is back at the Tank, September 24th, with How to Sing a Song. Those are always fun. And some theater to talk about on our next show, uh, possibly on September 29th. Metropolitan Playhouse is back. A Private Peace, well, I've seen it's really good. And a million plays we saw that are closed that you should see what we wrote about. Parody Production. Pick up your performing arts inside of Earth, Cultural Heartbeat of New York City. Next show, September 29th. Go to Facebook. Twitter and YouTube. 